just two short months out from Dragon Ball Sparking Zero releasing, and there is a lot of energy in the air, and I've seen tons of predictions. Now, today I actually want to go over a few of the things that I've seen that I want to give my take on that I'm not exactly sure if anybody else has covered in the same way, not that I've seen anyway. The very first thing that I want to talk about is people postulating that there's definitely going to be more than 164 characters, and uh, to this I would actually say that I guess you can think that, but we have no concrete evidence whether that's going to be the case or not. Now, it does stand to show right now that every single time they've released these character trailers, they've shown us that grid and placed characters within that grid, making the grid more and more complete. Now, out of those 164 spots that are on that grid, that's pretty much all we have to work with. So unless we have some kind of official statement or confirmation from the company themselves, uh, Bandai Namco is pretty much telling us that this is going to be the base roster, at least that's the information that we have to go with so anything that's outside of that is not even really speculation it's pure guesswork at that point and it's somebody's just like opinion so you can have that share that mentality and share that mindset I am just going based on the actual evidence that we have and nothing more so to me everybody has to fit within this 164 character bubble now I've stated before that People keep on saying that there's going to be a lot of characters that we're not seeing within here, like the hints at Dragon Ball characters and Dragon Ball GT characters and all of that stuff. Like I said in my last video, a lot of these characters are releasing are playing as part of the story mode. So the story that we know covers from the beginning of the Saiyan Saga when they fight Raditz up into the point where Goku defeats J Jiren in the Tournament of Power, and that's 100% what we know for sure is going to be in the game. Now, a lot of other people keep on trying to speculate other things such as like, well, they can just add more characters and whatnot, and everybody was in threes, so they should be back in this. Um, that's not necessarily the case because in Dragon Ball Budokai Tenkaichi 3, uh, we had about, I think it was like 161 characters in that game. And in this game, there's 164. So what they basically did is they took away movies, took away GT, took away Dragon Ball, and they added all the Dragon Ball Super characters that are required for the story. Because they do have to cover three entire arcs for the story, plus like the OVAs or whatever that were covered in the story as well. Like battle of the gods and stuff like that. When we're actually replacing all these characters with the new characters, that's not to say that the old characters are going to come back. I definitely think the old characters are coming back just based on the fact that a lot of these characters seem like up versions of their older Tenkaichi 3 counterparts. So it's not exactly that hard of a jump. It's the same thing they did with like with uh, Raging Blast, except they can just take those earlier Tenkaichi 3 models and up them, and a lot of them have like very similar, if not exact, movesets that they did before. So it wouldn't be too far out of the realm of possibility to expect that they've come back. Sure, we've gotten hints here and there, like somebody in the demo changing the narrator's voice over, and they moved it over, I think, from Beerus, and it went to King Vegeta, speculating that King Vegeta may appear in the game. And again, he was one of the newer characters was added to Tenkaichi 3 after Tenkaichi 2. So, being as he's already in there, we see audio files, I would assume that he'd be returning, but again, I don't know in what capacity and how they're going to do this, how they're going to play this out, because they already have their whole roadmap planned, so we should be seeing some kind of information about DLC around after the time of the launch of the game, but right now they're just focusing on the launch, and everything's very specifically curated. Like, we can even see the trailers for the sagas now implementing, where they do one per month. Uh, they started with, you know, the saying up to Frieza, and then the next arc's going to be the Android arc slash cell arc and then the final trailer before the game releases is going to be the boo arc there is some speculation that there's going to be one last trailer that just like fills in all the gaps and shows everybody while that is somewhat probable at this point i'd say i'd kind of hold off on wanting that because i do want to be surprised at unlocking some characters i don't want part of the joy for me for these games is unlocking the characters and stuff and yes we've seen the story a billion times but the new what if spins actually put like a bigger emphasis on uh, discoverability for this game and while some of them seem pretty generic at this point we don't know how far into these what if set they're gonna go and this brings me into my next point what if characters and what if scenarios now I have been seeing people kind of talk about the new mode that is in there where you're like kind of setting up your custom battle thing as like a what if scenario but that's not necessarily the case and I hope people curb their expectations for this mode because it does seem that it's very restrictive in the sense of you choose a character you choose an opening dialogue a closing dialogue and then you also can choose dialogues that happen at certain points within there and these are accompanied by cinematics but it's not something that like would be extremely crazy. Let's say you have, let's say you have a scenario where you have Android 16 
versus like Jiren or Topo or something. And you can like kind of replace him and say that like, what if he survived and he was in the Tournament of Power or whatever. Select your Sage, select your Dialogue, and uh, select like 50% like health or 25% health, at which point these are going to activate. And uh, you just let it play out. Now this is not gonna be like something super crazy or expansive with like super unique custom dialogue to where you can actually envision this as a what if scenario. It's kind of just a fun way to like play out these kind of like unique battles in your head. And I've seen a lot of people make fun of it and say that it's kind of like Bandai Namco forcing us to make our own video game instead of putting stuff in there. And while there is some validity to that, I don't hold exactly to that point. Uh, this is gonna be a fun mode just for me and just for other people who would like wanna stream the game or like, record background stuff, but I assume it's gonna get old pretty fast for a lot of people, and some people might not even touch the mode. While I do think that that is a cool mode and a cool feature to add, I don't really consider that what if scenarios or in the what if territories. So far, all we've seen from the what if stuff is when we're actually in the sagas, we have a choice to make probably during the last battle of how it's going to play out one way or another, and it doesn't affect the rest of the story of the game. It's just for that one specific chapter. This could be a what if thing for every chapter, but I'm kind of assuming it's for, kind of for the last battle of that said saga or of that said chapter. And that's just pretty much where it's gonna play out from there. We're not gonna go off into some new fantasy land where the whole game comes like a different thing because like Goku decides to uh, merc for Vegeta in the Saiyan Saga or something akin to that. I think we're gonna see pretty generic what ifs based on the amount that they have in there. Hopefully we're gonna get, get to see something on the level of like Tenkaichi 2's what ifs, but I'm not holding my breath for that. Everyone who played that game, like that's my favorite Tenkaichi, knows how good those what ifs were. Like what if like Raditz hit his head and became good, one of the Z fighters, and like never fought, fought alongside of him. Uh, that stuff was amazing, and I really hope they actually do do more stuff like that, but like I said, I tend to go by evidence, so for right now, what it seems like is those what-if scenarios are pretty much just like one choice that really, it doesn't affect the rest of the game, it just affects like that one battle, and we'll probably get a separate score for that battle, but that's about it. Uh, outside of that, I don't know how many people are anticipating that these DLC characters are going to come out fast. Like for example, they say for the first DLC pack we're getting 20 plus characters, but we all know how Tenkaichi likes to count characters, they count every single form as a different individual character, so that can easily get mowed down. I've already gone over who I think is going to be in that pack for at least the Dragon Ball Super Superhero characters and the Daima characters, and it pretty much like does take care of that pretty swiftly. But I don't know how their roadmap is going to play out, because if they're assuming they're giving us 20 characters, we don't know how far or fast this DLC is going to roll out. Are we getting packs? Are we getting like smaller packs? And they just take like a year to give us like the first 20 characters? I hope not. Hopefully it's even less than six months. Like I'd like it quarterly at least. That way like we can get onto the next pack. But I don't know how much longevity they're trying to pump into this game before they do other projects or do something else on, on that nature. So I think that like whether their schedule holds up to be slow or fast is determining whether we'll actually see GT in movies. Now again, I, I am of the belief that we are getting GT in movies. I just don't think we're gonna get them in base. I think we're definitely gonna be getting them in DLC and it'll be a big reason for people to buy the DLC. And if they're doing mix and match packs, like we can like see whoever we're gonna see. And a lot of people have told me, they said, well, Mark, we could get like one character representing that saga. Again, I don't think that's the case just because of the fact that it's only covering certain parts of the story. So I think that if you just like throw Super Saiyan 4 Goku in there uh, off the jump without him being like a, um, pre-order bonus character or something, it doesn't quite make sense for the game's character roster. I think we are gonna be seeing some other people. Now, another thing that I've been noticing that people have been getting some misinformation on is that pre-order bonus character that's been showing up. Now, they said that the pre-order bonus character is going to be somebody who's never been in a Tenkaichi game before, and I'm automatically assuming that this means the Raging Blast series as well, so we're gonna kinda like couple those two together. But when it comes to that character specifically, I've seen a lot of people talk about people like Moro and stuff like that. And unfortunately, the Dragon Ball Tenkaichi games have never really actually used the characters from the anime themselves, uh, from the manga themselves, because the manga has different licensing rights than the anime, just like the movies have different licensing rights from the anime itself. Uh, all these rights are different, and Shueisha are like the big ones in charge of the manga. Uh, it's Shueisha with Bird Studio, which is like a, a Kira Toriyama studio, which is like kind of like in a weird spot right now. But when it comes down specifically to Shueisha, 
Uh, they just haven't really let it in there. Now, Jump Force and J Stars and like all the Jump Stars Ultimate and stuff like on, on the DS, like all those games are using specifically the manga characters. That's why we got like Thousand Year Blood War arc and stuff in Jump Force. It's because they have the license to the manga, uh, not necessarily the anime. And even though the anime is usually reflective of the manga, in this case, it's actually not. And they're not gonna be, be putting brand new characters like from the manga without the licensing rights in this, especially when they're not gonna be able to cover their saga. So you're not gonna be seeing like Granola or Moro or somebody like that. It's pretty much just gonna be somebody, I'm thinking it's gonna be like an altered form. Like we got similarly with Raging Blast, we got Super Saiyan 3 Vegeta and Super Saiyan 3 Broly. We get something cool where we have a pre-existing character that gets a new form or something like that. Outside of that, I'm not exactly sure who it's gonna be, unless it's somebody completely ridiculous, like a Joe character like Minaka or somebody from Super. I wouldn't count that we're getting anybody from the manga. That's pretty safe bet to actually say. I'm still super excited about this game. Like I plan on playing it a lot. I just got a PlayStation Portal yesterday so I can play it in bed. <laughs> like I am uh, very hyped for this game. Now, the, the only thing that like is a little worrisome to me is like I've talked about before is overhyping stuff. Like people are going to be building up this game in their heads based on what they see YouTubers say, what they see like uh, influencers say or on social media. And I think that's like the exact wrong take to do. Just take every bit of information that we're given officially and apply that to your expectation of the game and everything else is just a surprise because if you're gonna overhype the game, you're gonna be disappointed ultimately when the things that you are super hyped about aren't gonna be in the game uh, or are further down the lane for DLC or whatnot. So I just wanna caution you against that. We wanna always keep everything uh, at a neutral level so we can be excited for something, but don't overhype things. It's, it's uh, really important in the games industry because it happens a lot and people oftentimes get disappointed and if people place the blame from the disappointment, not on the YouTubers who influence them, not on themselves for being taken in, but usually they put it on the studio. Well, they should have made the game this way or we're gonna fix this game. We already see this now with people fixing the artwork on like Twitter and whatnot, they'll just have like a picture of the screenshot and then a fixed version, even though all these versions that they're showing are from old builds and every time they've released the new stuff, they've seen it improve vastly. So we don't even know what it's gonna look like by the time it comes out in two months. I'm sure the game's already way been platinum and stuff and they've just been debugging for a while. So we'll see what happens. They're just planning on fixing things up before the final patch drops. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring the video to a close. As I always said, I love it. Thank you. And thank you. Ivy Valentine subscribes to Mark Yoon, so should you. Enjoy your treat!